Thank you. It's uh, great to be here in Boston on St. Patrick's Day with a last name like Walsh and a mother named Maureen Irene Pardee. So uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. If you didn't know, everyone is Irish on St. Patrick's Day. So no matter your heritage, we're green and celebrate. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So when we look at the quality landscape, there's really a lot of people out there who are using the word quality as a, as a measure and trying to, to get us to participate in their world of quality. There's SCHIP, there's Leapfrog Group, there's UHC, there's all of these different organizations, all who have the, the word, word quality in there, but not all of them are using the same measures or metrics or process to even evaluate us. So the purpose of this talk is to give you a little bit more information about what quality measures are there, where does the data come from, how are they created from data? And then how are they being used to create standards that you and I are being held to in these various reporting structures? So the real purpose of a quality measure is generally to, number one, drive improvement, try and make things better. Number two, to create accountability. And sometimes that accountability is at the institutional level, and sometimes that's at the individual level. And then three, to perform research or studies. You can, you can quibble about whether quality is research or not, but in order to create a, a knowledge base to make things better. And many times a combination of these is being done at the same time. Often this process is iterative. You collect an initial baseline data that helps you identify what the problems are, and then you're cyclically through PDSA cycles or any of the number of quality tools out there getting subsequent measurements to try and evaluate both the impact of the change and to make additional improvements as time goes on. When we look at quality, a framework was first uh, established in about 1966. So there was a Lebanese surgeon who ended up at the University of Michigan, and he published about quality, quality metrics being divided into three big categories. So what is the structure? And these are things that have to do with the delivery setting. What is the process, and how is that care being given? And then what are the outcomes, which is really a validity uh, metric of how effective we're being. And I'm going to talk about these three, and then we're going to go through some of the different quality metrics that might fall under them. So structural me uh, measures are the ones that are often easiest for us to get our hands on. How big's your hospital? How many operations did your hospital do? How many operations did you do? Are you subspecialty trained or not? What's your nurse to bed ratio? Is your ICU care open or closed? Um, do you have access to a robot? So those are things that are fairly easy to establish about the structure of your practice. And they're good for assessment, but they're really not all that great for improvement. And we said improvement's one of the really important things about a quality measure. These come from observational studies. Um, they're considered an inexpensive proxy. So a lot of people will argue that the volume that you do of a particular operation is an indicator of how well you do that operation. There's a lot of studies to argue one way or the other about that. But it is an inexpensive way to try and judge you. Um, measure differences may not always represent quality differences. You don't have control over everything that's in there. You can't control the size of your hospital necessarily. You can leave your hospital, but you can't change the size of your hospital every day. Um, and so these aren't always very helpful for assessing true quality. Then we move into that second category, which are the process measures. And these are about the care that are actually received. How complete was the H&P? What steps did you do in a diagnostic evaluation? What radio radiographic studies did you do? Can you justify the operation that you did? Was there coordination in the care? Um, it has to do with the throughput of the patient through the process. And these are often used and commonly used for indiv individual assessment of you as a physician, as well as assessment of the hospital or the department that you're working in. A lot of the information is in the medical record. These type of process measures are very amenable to doing randomized studies to try and assess one place versus another place. It can be a little bit difficult to pull out subpopulations which are at higher risk of problems or uh, more complicated patients. Um, but most people will uh, appropriately or not link process measures to patient outcomes. Um, and that may or may not be a valid comparison. Some of the process measures that you're most familiar with are the SKIP ones. So the SKIP project developed out of a national partnership with a number of organizations. Its intent was to reduce your post-operative complications. And some of the SKIP measures that you've seen are all really process measures. They're not really outcome measures. 
Uh, many of them are modified over time. Some of them everybody gets so compliant with that they pull them out or they determine that they really weren't as valid as they thought and they replace them with new ones. But adherence to these process measures has not been directly associated with improved patient outcomes in many cases, okay? So you gotta use them with a little bit of caution. More ideal for us were, would be the outcome measures. So what is the actual effect of the care that you're giving to the patient? And most of the time we've measured this with morbidity and mortality. And surgeons are more familiar than that with many, than many of the other specialties. But you also can look at resource utilization, cost involved in it, readmission rates. You can go to those HCAP scores and look at patient satisfaction. And more importantly, what's the patient's quality of life as an outcome of what you've done? These would be the most desirable for surgeons because it's easy for us to translate work at outcomes measures into seeing our patients do well. Just knowing that you're being studied often leads to this Hawthorne effect of you improving your outcomes, but really measuring them can be a little bit difficult. It doesn't look at your surgical technique, for example. It just looks at whether you did the case and whether you, they came back or not. Um, these often have to be risk-adjusted and population-specific. If a surgeon's willing to take on the patients that everyone else already had a complication on, or the, the morbidly obese population for cholecystectomies versus the healthy young kids that I'm often dealing with, it doesn't always lead to a, a, an outcome measure that can be translated across populations. And it doesn't always tell you why there was a difference. It just tells you that there was a difference. So trying to break down and get into outcomes measures requires that you look fairly carefully at the data source and the size of the numbers of patients in that data source in order for you to make a valid association. So um, people who are involved in quality often know this, but for those who are new to the world of, of quality, when you look at data, we divide our databases often into an administrative database versus a clinical database. And administrative databases are often also nicknamed claims data because most of the information in them comes from billing. So somebody that um, is not a clinician often has done the billing for the hospital or billing for the practice, and that information is what is used to create these databases. So the largest one used is really the CMS um, database, and uh, they have different types of databases within there. The problem with this database is that A, it's only claims data, um, B, that you can't actually get the data in a fast enough fashion to be able to make changes based on it. Um, another one is called the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, which is a little bit more robust than the CMS, and you can get a little bit faster, um, although not terribly faster. Um, it combines multiple other administrative databases together into one searchable database that'll allow you to get a little bit broader information and it has a larger number of patients in it. And then the all payers claims database is a, a consortium of healthcare insurers. So not CMS, but private insurers. And it's been adding states as it goes along and it's also becoming a strong database that you could use to get administrative data. On the other side of the database world are the clinical databases. And the ACS and SQIP is really the one that we're probably the most familiar with. Um, just for a historical background, this came out of the VA surgical risk studies. So the VA was constantly saying their patients were older and sicker and that's why their outcomes weren't as good. And Congress mandated that they study and prove that. And so they did just that and the robust um, system of creating that data was so popular it began to be spread out. The ACS uh, engaged into it, and, and now all of us are uh, in major hospitals are using it. It's not cheap, though. It's a fairly expensive um, process. Many of the of you that are in smaller practices or in private practice may not have access uh, or the means in, to engage the N NSQIP database. Um, there are some other ones out there, as Anne pointed out. The STS is one of the most robust, uh, the, NT, uh, the National Trauma Database, and, and there are a whole cadre of others for almost every subspecialty that we run into. I point out the National Cancer Database because that's the oldest one in the country, um, and it will allow you to compare compare benchmarks across the can various cancer centers. And then the SEER is another one that's commonly used. It gives a lot of epidemiology data. And it has a, there's a, 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 a 
portion of it that is linked to the Medicare uh, claims database that allows you to sort of combine portions of a clinical database with some administrative data. And all of these different databases will have their pros and cons. Once you have data, many people then go about trying to create measures. And who can create measures? Actually, anyone. Any of you sitting in the audience could decide that you wanted to create a quality measure. Um, the majority of the ones that are used in surgery right now are being created by professional organizations such as the STS. Um, and even hospital consortiums can create their own. How are they created? Well, there's a really a lot of different methodologies that are used. So people will um, talk about taking studies and doing grade analysis. Um, they'll produce consensus statements. They'll write evidence-based reviews. Uh, many of you are familiar with the SAGE's guidelines. That would fall into that category there. Uh, many will convene expert panels, and they'll form a consensus paper out of that. And all of those can be considered quality measures of one form. And then where do you find them? Uh, most organizations will publish them, and then many websites will either uh, not only post them, but, but host them in addition to the initial organization that created it. But how do you know if those measures that were created are really any good? So you want to assess a quality measure on whether it's important. I, I don't really care whether the hospital gowns are green or blue. That's not an important measure. It doesn't affect outcomes. So you got to make sure it's actually important to people. And, and the, the more, more people that are affected by it, the more important it's going to be considered. Is it scientifically sound? And is it feasible? So just because you can measure it doesn't mean you can do it in a cost-effective way. And if it's too expensive to actually study and you're not going to get good data out of it, then maybe you shouldn't actually be doing it. Once measures are created, there's really two big organizations that I want to talk about that will host those uh, and evaluate those. So the NQMC, the National Quality Measures Clearinghouse, is an online website and repository of quality measures that was created under HHS in the AHRQ. There are so many acronyms with letters here, it's impossible to know them all. But it basically, this is government paid for. They host this. And their goal is to promote access to quality measures. These are not necessarily ones that CMS is going to be using. But if you were starting a project in your hospital where you wanted to look at something like your, your uh, peritoneal dialysis catheter complication rate, you could go to the NQMC and find metrics on peritoneal dialysis catheters. They don't endorse the measures. They don't decide that it's a good measure or a bad measure, but they do have very strict quality criteria for them being included in there. On the other side of that is the NQF that Ann was bringing up. And they tend to be a little bit different. They're actually going to endorse the measure. They're going to say, this one's really good. We think this is one you should be judged on. And CMS actually does contracts with them and arranges for them to endorse measures for things they think are important. So if it's in the NQF database, chances are someday you might be judged on that for payment purposes. I'm going to go back to the NQM. So uh, the NQMC actually requires that one of your, your, your quality metric fit into one of these categories. And that first category is very similar to the three categories I showed you at the top, process, structure, and outcome. They've added a few in there. And if you want to be in this NQMC database, you have to fit into one of those domains. It has to be a metric that's currently in use. You have to document some good things about it, like why did you do it, what's the data, show the sources, how many people were involved, what were the exclusion criteria, how strong was the data, is it valid and reliable, and show the literature citations before it can make it in there. And if you put your, um, if you put your metric in there, it actually, you own it, but you also have to keep it up. So kind of like, uh, what was <laughs> anyway, if you create the metric every year, you're supposed to reassess it for its validity, make sure it's still valid, update it if it needs to be updated. If it goes into the NQF, the NQF is a little different. They want to make sure that they can endorse it. So they will put out calls for particular measures. They'll identify gaps where there aren't any measures, but we need to have measures. And then they'll assess those for whether they're good for federal reporting right now or not. And they are very specific about measuring and putting these um, different 
measures against what's called the N National Quality Strategy in an annual report that goes to Congress. If you look in your SAGE's book, there are six different little symbols that are associated with many of the talks. Does this have to do with patient safety? Does this have to do with patient experience? Those are the same six categories that are in this National Quality Strategy. So SAGE's is taking our own meeting and mapping, mapping them against this same metric here. If a metric goes to the NQF, there's a, this is their diagram of what happens to it when it gets there. So step one is they evaluate whether it's going to drive importance, wh whether it's going to drive improvement, whether it's aligned with that national quality strategy, and whether there's good clinical evidence for it. Secondly, they're going to assess the scientific acceptability of it. They're going to decide if it's uh, based on a valid database. Can it be reproduced? Can it help uh, classify providers as good or bad? Then they're going to determine if it's feasible. Is it, it, again, just because you can collect the data uh, doesn't mean that it's not so expensive and so burdensome that you shouldn't be doing it. Then they're going to determine whether that metric is usable. And if so, it, should it be used for payment basis? Finally, they're going to assess it uh, against competing measures. So if more than one measure about the same area has been published, they will try and take those, combine them, separate them, much like a House and a Senate bill. They have to get together and form one bill that's going to be going forward for signature. And they do that as a step in this process. Uh, currently, in the NQF, we have some surgical voices. So there's a steering committee for surgery quality measures. This is made up of 25 individual appointed members. And they've currently approved 22 measures, and they have about another 20 or so that are under review. There's also what's called the consensus approval committee. That's sort of like the board afterwards. So anything that makes it through this steering committee goes on to a formal um, leadership committee. And that one has one surgeon on it and that, that has a final statement, a, a final approval process. There are a number of advisory committees, technical panels, and action teams that they'll call at various times to assess measures that have to do with surgery as things goes on. And as Ann pointed out, there are a number of member organizations that they'll pull people from, and SAGES and the ACS are both members. If you yourself want to get involved in this process, you can. Um, the National Quality Forum currently has a call for nominations out for people who are interested in writing and evaluating quality metrics. In addition, CMS has their own uh, request for technical expert postings. They'll always post the areas that they're evaluating. You can go on that website and say, I'm an expert in this area, and volunteer to evaluate these same metrics. So in summary, quality measures are intended to be uh, driving improvement, creating accountability, and to do research with them. They can be classified as evaluating the structure, the process, or the outcomes. And currently, most of them are process, although we'd prefer that they were outcomes. They are created by a variety of different uh, data sources by different stakeholders, including SAGES. That the NQMC is a repository of robust measures that you can use in your own institution for trying to evaluate evaluate your own quality. The NQF uh, has a little bit more uh, different process. They endorse particular ones, and many of those go on to be used for pay for performance, and that you too can be part of this process. Thank you very much.